Hello everybody and welcome to this Writing New South Wales First Friday event. This is part of an online series in which we talk to industry leaders across the writing and publishing sector to help writers get a better understanding of, of how our sector works. I'm Jane McCready, I'm the CEO of Writing New South Wales and today I'll be talking to Rosemary Milsom, an award-winning journalist and the founding director of the Newcastle Writers' Festival, which is now in its ninth year. Before we start our conversation, I would like to acknowledge the Gadigal and Wongal people of the Eora Nation from whose lands this event has been broadcast today and pay respects to their elders and storytellers, past, present and emerging. I also acknowledge the Awabakal and Waramai people from whose lands our guest, Rosemary Milsom, is joining us as well as the traditional custodians of all the lands you are joining us from today. Feel free to make your own acknowledgement of country in the chat box if you would like to do that. As you'll see if you've been looking at the chat box, audience members are muted to ensure the best sound quality for everybody, but you can put any questions you may have for Rosemary in the chat box and we'll ask her as many as we have time for at the end of the session. You can also use the chat box to communicate with other audience members if you like, or to let our staff know if you're having any technical issues. They'll do their best to help. When in doubt, the best solution is to exit the Zoom meeting and then rejoin from the link you were sent by email. We'll also be posting some poll questions at some point during the session, which you might like to answer. As it says in the chat box, to see our speakers toggle your screen to speak of you in the top right-hand corner of the Zoom window. If you want to see the other audience members, toggle your view to gallery view but we do recommend you stay on speak of you throughout the event. We are recording the event, so if you drop out or have to leave early, you'll be able to watch it on our website later. And now, welcome to Rosemary Milsom. Hello. <laughs> Rosemary, did you have a bookish childhood? We can see lots of books behind you there. Yes, I did, I did. Um, I'm one of six children, and uh, most of our childhood, um, our mother raised us on her own. And she studied, so she worked in health, but um, she started an arts degree remotely through the University of New England. We were in Sydney. And so she was doing English and history and there were always textbooks around. I remember the Norton, um, the Norton collections, the two volumes, the really paper thin, um, you know, books, like almost like Bibles really, the really thin paper. So books were always around. She dragged me to the Fisher Library at Sydney Uni when, she'd get some babysitting time and I was the photocopy girl. And so she'd have these windows of opportunity to kind of catch up on some texts. And I'd stand there and photocopy big, you know, chapters out of books in a mad rush because we only had a window of four or five hours. And then she might not be able to get back to the library for another few months. So um, yeah, books were always, I remember the smell of the Fisher Library really clearly. And you know, walls and walls of books. And I read avidly and she was an only child, so she was a really advanced reader. She, I mean, she read Jane Eyre when she was nine and she gave it to me when I was nine and it was completely impenetrable. I just couldn't, I didn't understand it. I, I, I just couldn't deal with it. I, I obviously wasn't as advanced as she was. <laughs> I was more likely to be found outdoors playing, uh, playing footy with my brothers or I was very outdoorsy as well. So I, I remember I've still got that copy of Jane Eyre and when I was old enough to really take that book in, I mean, it's now, it's one of my all-time favourite novels. So, um, so yeah, it's long answer to a question. Yes, I did grow up with lots of books. The themes in Jane Eyre don't seem incredibly suitable to a nine-year-old. No, no. But, you know, she was taking me to European films and with subtitles when I, you know, when I was a pretty, quite a young age. So uh, uh, I, th I think she felt that, um, she, I don't know, maybe being an only child, it was sort of that sense of wanting to share those experiences with, with someone. Yeah. Did you have favourite books? What were they? Well, look, I did, you know, Enid Blyton, I think, was um, was compulsory for our generation. And I loved Enid Blyton books. But then I progressed in high school to the Babysitter's Club and all, you know, I didn't mind. Uh, Stephen King, I loved Stephen King books. I remember in high school sitting there and, you know, because of, I couldn't put them down. And I remember having the book on my lap and I'd be petrified reading I'd be close to the end and so I read a lot of Stephen King um, as a teenager then I probably lost a little bit of interest I think possibly backed off HSC took over and just focused on the school texts which I I mean I you know people's memories might not take them back that far but there was a big there was a bit of a change with the curriculum and I was really lucky because 
was a big focus on Australian literature. And I remember reading An Open Swimmer, Tim Winton's debut novel that had won the Vogel Prize. And he's, you know, he's remains one of my favourite writers. And I was lucky enough to meet him at an event in Byron Bay a couple of years ago. And I took that copy of An Open Swimmer with all my little penciled in notes that I was studying for the HSC and asked him to sign it for me. And, uh, and you know, I debate Tim Winton to the cows come home with people. They, they either love him or they hate him. But so I, I, I tended to do more school related reading and reading um, that had a, had a purpose to it that, you know, I had to study, I had to learn it and probably didn't go back to more social reading or my own personal reading till after I finished university, to be honest. Did you, did you as a child want to work in that world or, or did you want to be a footballer? I wanted to be a journalist. So from a, quite a young age, I decided at about 12 or 13 that I'd be a journalist. And I did work experience in year 10, year 11, year 12. And so it was very much around words. I think that was the thing for me. And, and one of my oldest books, which I had to dig out recently because I was participating, uh, um, the Australia Council has a leadership program and I was lucky enough to be selected. And of course, it's all been delayed because of COVID. It was meant to happen last year. So we got together in Wagga a month ago and we were asked to bring an item that was significant to us and share it with us, we broken up into small groups. And I struggled to think of what I could take. I mean, yeah, look, I've got paintings on the wall and photographs, but then I thought of that book and it's called A First Dictionary. It's a little red covered, it's really battered. I would have received it in probably year two or three maybe. So eight, eight years old, and I, I clearly remember taking it home. It was a textbook, opening it up, and the penny dropped. I suddenly realised that there was an order to words, that, you know, there was an alphabetical order, and, and that, you know, light bulb just popped off. And, and then I sat there and I was looking at all these amazing words and, oh, wow, you could use this word. And I, I, I still remember that so clearly. And we're going back a long time ago, <laughs> over 40 years. And I still have that book. And something clicked then about words, about the challenge, about being, you know, what is the right word? What is the best word? Um, what's a more interesting word? It, it just sort of got my attention and I failed hopelessly at maths, but I imagine it's similar for people. Well, I know friends of mine who are very good at maths who talk about that. And so it's effortless. You know, there's this sense that, well, once you get the logical steps, that's all you have to follow. But my brain could never get those logical steps with numbers and still can't. I'm no help to my teenage son at all with his homework, but the words just, yeah, words just sort of came. Words, I could understand words and where to place words. And, uh, and I think that drove my um, desire to be a journalist. So how did you go about making that happen? It's not exactly an easy career path. No, well, um, my mother said exactly the same thing. And, and I was going to study communications. And she said, I think you're narrowing your options. Why don't you do an arts degree? And then you could teach, which I was adamant I wasn't going to teach, but you could go into academia. I think she felt frustrated because that's probably a path she she would have taken if, if she had her time again. She ended up doing her, her arts degree. It took her seven years, raising six children on her own, working full-time in health. Um, and then she did her MLit in history. So I think she felt that I had more options. So I, I listened, you know, I know she thinks I don't listen to her, but I did listen. And I did an arts degree and I absolutely loved every minute of it. And I focused on, in the end, um, English and drama. And, um, but I applied for a cadetship at the Newcastle Herald. That, by this stage, I grew up in Sydney, but we moved to Newcastle when I was in my last year of high school. I applied for a cadetship and um, I was probably in third year university and missed out. And the editor at the time said, look, you came really close. You, you know, if a job comes up, you'll be next kind of cab off the rank. And I thought, okay, well, what do I do now? Uh, you know, what am I going to do? We'll just wait. And um, so again, mum said to me, why don't you do your dip ed? Just add a year, you know, no skin off your nose. Just do the year. It'll be, it's a good skill to have, good qualification. So I did my dip ed in English and um, 
thought the Herald would call any minute and get me out of it and I wouldn't have to be a teacher and I wouldn't have to stand in front of a classroom. Well, that didn't happen. I did do teaching. I did my year of teaching and I absolutely loved it. And I loved my prax and I went really, really well. And I thought, okay, well, the Herald doesn't call. I'll, maybe I will be a teacher. And I finished my dip ed and I got a placement at Newcastle High for a stint, a teacher had gone to Japan on exchange or something like that and was going to be away. So I was well into teaching and thought that, and then got home that day, we didn't have mobile phones, but there was a message on my answering machine at home saying, this is Chris Watson and he's the deputy, he was the deputy editor, editor at the Newcastle Herald, can you call, call me as soon as you get this. And they had a job for me. Um, they just sacked a third year cadet and I was a third year because I was a graduate. So if you weren't a graduate of university, you had to do a three-year cadetship. So you could go straight from school. And that probably, you know, would have been a preference of mine. But in hindsight, I'm really glad I, I did go to university. And so I got, I walked away from teaching. Uh, so I was 18 months or more after I originally didn't get that position that I got the opportunity. And I think once you worked for somewhere like the Newcastle Herald, it was a renowned Fairfax paper. Yeah still is not a Fairfax paper anymore as we know Fairfax nine now owns Fairfax but they carved off um, all the regionals so the Illawarra Mercury Canberra Times Newcastle Herald are now part of ACM which is Australian Community Media where my husband still works and um, and so yeah once I got into I got a foot in the door that was it you know I knew that I could get to Sydney it was a pretty well-worn path of journalists from the Newcastle Herald to Sydney a lot are still around um, incredible journalists Mark Riley at Seven News and was a um, print journalist there's a whole lot of them. Greg Bearup um, he was at Fairfax and he was at the Australian and so there's a whole kind of um, cohort of former Newcastle Herald journalists who, who went on to amazing things. The media landscapes obviously changed a lot since you started um, a lot of the economic basis for newspapers has been cut away from them is that partly why you're not working full-time as a journalist now is that yes I mean I I, I I took two redundancies actually I took one from Sydney uh, I went ended up at the Sun Herald and um, that's that that's really that really started my connections with publishing I um, worked at Sunday Life magazine for a while as a feature writer but I also commissioned book reviews I wrote book reviews I interviewed writers then I moved on to the main newspaper and edited a news feature section I, I was the founding editor of that and that included review book reviews and literary pages so that's when I started my connection with really strong connection with publishing many of those people I met back then so we're going back to 2000 uh, are still a good good friends of mine now very close friends I mean publishing is a small world in Australia and people just essentially move around the different publishers they, they, that's that's the only change that happens uh, and so I think that um I, the, for family reasons, we were going, coming back to Newcastle and at the same time, so I took maternity leave, we came back in 2008 and the plan was to stay for my maternity leave. My husband was able to do his job from Newcastle, the Newcastle Herald office, and we'd go back to Sydney and we didn't go back. Um, so I ended, and, and while I was on maternity leave, a round of redundancies came up. There'd been numerous rounds of redundancies, really stressful experience. And we decided that I'd put my hand up. So I took, I took a redundancy then and ended up back at the Newcastle Herald a few years later. I had another child and I ended up back at the Newcastle Herald in 2011. And they'd been protected from redundancies, actually. There'd only been uh, one substantial round. So I felt like I was going to be on solid ground for a while. Well, sure enough, another round hit the Newcastle Herald in 2015. And I just thought, I can't keep doing this. And we're both on the payroll. It was very nerve wracking. So I decided to take the leap. I'd started the Writers' Festival a, few years, a couple of years before that. Um, wasn't really earning any money at the Writers' Festival. So when I left, I, I did have a substantial freelance journalism sort of um, schedule. I did quite a lot of writing still. And then, I, I don't know, various circumstances, I you know, just not feeling valued. Um, and that comes out in, you know, now what you get paid as a freelancer, the word rate and the amount of effort I put in. And I mean, that's one thing that you learn at Fairfax. You learned back in the day, it was all about quality. 
So when you've kind of been indoctrinated um, around quality, it's it's really hard to let that go. And that's ultimately why I, I left. They were introducing a new um, platform where I was essentially not going to have any sub editors behind me checking my work. And I was writing 2,000, 3,000 word stories. So there'd be no one checking my work. I would have to do that myself. I'd have to write my own headlines and captions, which I did a bit of anyway. Um, and I, I just thought, I can't, I can't keep doing it. I, I really just thought I cannot keep doing it. And it was so disheartening. And I've gone through, I'm thinking of writing about this, actually. I've, I've, I've realised now I've gone through a period of grief about it because I loved what I did. And, yeah, in some senses, it's, I don't know, I suppose it's like any disappointing relationship. You walk away and you think, why did I invest so much in it? I shouldn't have. I should have held back. I should have looked at other options. And um, so it kind of feels like the aftermath of a bad relationship in a sense. And I think it's taken me probably the last three or four years to come to terms with that. And it's sad, but there's nostalgia for what was. And I know that it's not the same anymore. So when I get a pang of, because my husband still works in, in you know, newspapers, when I get a pang of, oh, I want to write that or I run, I, I I just think, yeah, but you don't want to go back to that. It's not how it used to be. So I wouldn't be returning to what I'm missing. What I'm missing has gone. Yes, as a former journalist, I'm very much empathising with what yeah. you saying. So tell us about that decision to start the Writers' Festival. Where did that idea come from? I'd always gone to Writers' Festivals. And when I was at the Sun Herald, because I was looking after the literary pages there, I... Um, would host sessions at Sydney Writers Festival. So we're going back a fair while now. So when Carol Llewellyn was there at Sydney Writers Festival, then Wendy Weir. So, and then, um, I, so I would facilitate sessions. And I, I don't even know how that really came about because not a lot of print journalists necessarily do that public facing um, role. I mean, that's one of the great things about being a print journalist is your name's there, but you're not in a way. Your face, you know, I couldn't bear to be on TV. So I, I don't know, I just, I suppose I, I just wanted to, maybe it was a bit of the drama coming out of, you know, drama student coming out, but I, and I love books. So I remember hosting sessions and actually getting loaded up with lots of them. And I'd be rushing from the Sun Herald office on Sussex Street down to the festival to host a session, back to the office, then back. Uh, and that, I'd, I'd been to Adelaide Writers Festival a few years before that, um, but I just really liked festivals. And then I moved back to Newcastle and I had, a, I had my son, um, I've got a son from my first marriage, much, much older. So I had a son my whole way through. Um, well, I had him second year of university, end of second year of university. So um, I, he was much older, but I, had, I, I remarried and I had a son. And I remember I'd committed to hosting some sessions. We'd moved back here. I took my son who wasn't, who was still breastfeeding back to Sydney for the day so I could host two sessions got my best friend to come to the Walsh Bay where the festival was, walk my son around the block a few times so I could host a session. Then I fed, then I went back and did another session. And I thought, why do I have to, this is ridiculous. This is actually going to get ridiculous. Um, this is limited. You know, I'm not going to be able to do what I normally would do. It's a bit trickier getting to Sydney, finding a park, you've got a baby, et cetera, et cetera. And I thought, why do I have to go to Sydney? I mean, why, why can't I go to a festival in Newcastle? So I think I, I probably I wouldn't have been the first person who thought that. I'm sure I wouldn't have been the first person who thought that. But I don't know why I was the first person who thought, well, let's get it happening. Um, probably a combination of factors that I had the contacts in publishing. I'm pretty good at organising. I'd edited. So I'd edited sections in a newspaper. And in a way, a program is similar. You know, you want different themes you want light and dark you, you know you, you don't want um, the same you know tone throughout a whole feature section you want variety and and I think I have and I was commissioning so I, I knew how to kind of match make you know that sense of oh that writer would be great to interview that person or would be great on that topic and and so you see those um, connections and that's what putting us programs like um, you know, Jane yourself, like I would think, oh, this session I think would be great for Jane. Jane would probably like to host this session. I'll, I'll email her and see if she's interested. So you kind of, you are putting people, um, suitable people in the right place in a sense. And it's about having that 
it's a knack. I, I don't, I can't explain it. You can't learn it. I don't think. I think I've, well, I suppose you can learn it because I learned it. I wasn't born that way. Um, but I think you, there's a combination of skills. Um, I also write the program. That's uncommon. Most festival directors outsource that. Um, we don't have the resources. And I don't know that I could surrender that, uh, that sense of wanting to write the session titles, the session descriptions. And so um, that I suppose that's where I'm getting my satisfaction, um, that writing side of my brain, um, that creative side comes out now through the Curating festival. Curating is also creative, isn't it? That's yeah, very much so. Yeah, very much so. And it's about um, knowing the work. I, I, I do read a lot. So I pretty much don't say yes to a writer in the program if I haven't looked the work. I know that's that again is a little bit uncommon. Um, festival directors will make decisions. I mean, look, I won't say the name, but a, but a fairly big name writer has been, you know, pushed in my direction and has been at a lot of festivals and I just don't think the work stacks up. I know that sounds terrible, but I, I don't know. I, 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 anyway, I just, I've declined that person. Um, I've done that before. And so I sort of stand, you know, you have to stand by your decisions and, um, and I think quality, again, there's that Fairfax um, indoctrination, quality always wins in the end, I think. Mm -hmm. So that, I mean, that's the curatorial side, which is the, the creative side. But setting up a, a festival from scratch that must have been an enormous logistical challenge. Yeah, I had two kids. Well, my, oh, my much older son was, um, well, he was, I don't even know how old he was, but he was sort of finished school and everything. But I had two kids under four and a half and I worked full time at the Herald when I started it. And that was the situation for a couple of years. So I still, so I, the first festival was 20. 13 or 12 I'm trying to think now 20 so I mean um I didn't leave full-time journalism until 2015 till the end of 2015 so I did a good couple of years juggling a festival full-time work and two children under you know under school age and I everyone was saying to me at the time how do you do it I don't know how you do it and I just think oh well I don't know you just do it now I look back and go how did I do how did I do it I just I don't know how I did it I really didn't get a lot of sleep I would get up at four o'clock in the morning do a few hours work on the festival before work my normal job and then I would stay up late at night I remember emailing Adrian McGinty um great crime writer I love his work and emailing him he was based in Melbourne at the time saying oh is this flight okay because I have to book all the flights and book everyone's accommodation it was probably 12 30 in the morning he said yeah that flight's fine what what the hell are you doing up this late <laughs> and we had this email exchange at 12 30 in the morning and um it was kind of reassuring to know I wasn't the only one up up late but um yeah look I don't I don't know I mean when you're a working mum I'm, I'm probably I'm, I'm like most working mums you just compart compartmentalize your time and you learn that there's no perfect time. There's no, you can't carve out an, an, an idyllic two hours. You just grab that half hour or 15 minutes to send some emails when you can. And having been a mother from a very young age and finishing my uni degree and juggling motherhood, those habits were very well entrenched with me. I mean, I've always had to kind of pull off that juggling act. So um, I don't even really think too much about it anymore. Although in saying that now I'm older, uh, and I, yeah, I'm, I, I don't know, different kids too. My, 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 my second lot of my two kids, younger kids are very demanding in a different way. My daughter has quite, um, quite bad anxiety. And so that means I, 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 in all honesty, couldn't work like I used to work and be away from her in the way I used to be. Uh, I just wouldn't be able to do it. It wouldn't be good for her mental health. It wouldn't be good for mine either. And so in a sense, that's forced me to be very selective about what I do now. And while I'm not earning the money I used to earn and I make decisions much more now about being here for the kids, probably in a way that I never did in the past. And I do apologise to my eldest son, but he's a different hes a different kid. I mean, he's just a different person. He's very self-reliant and independent. And um, yeah, these two are a bit different. They're, they're put different. They're, they're, they're different personalities and have different needs. I imagine a lot of that early work when you were setting up the festival was essentially done on a volunteer basis. 
Um, yes. And then you've had to transition the festival to a more professional style of operation. Yeah, it's been slow. A lot of festivals, you know, get started by really enthusiastic volunteers who, who create great things, put a lot of work in, and then after a couple of years, they burn out and the festival dies. You've successfully turned Newcastle Writers Festival into a professional operation. I imagine that was pretty challenging to do. Yeah, and I think, look, and I, I can't, I'm always reluctant to talk about this because I, I don't want to seem like I'm some kind of martyr. I'm not at all. I'm not. But it was my eldest son, actually, he was doing business at uni. And he said to me one day, I don't know, I was talking to him about, about the festival program or something, some drama. And he said, um, you know, I'm doing this thing at university. And he said, you know, you're the, I should interview you. I mean, you are, you're an entrepreneur. What you've done with the festival, you're an entrepreneur. And I said, really? I don't know. I don't, I wouldn't think of myself like that at all. But in actual, but in, of course I am. I mean, in a sense, other festivals start with different models. I mean, there are some smaller festivals that that, that is more like a private operation. Um, people have made the decision that ticket income and any proceeds from those events go to them. It's a, it's and and with that, they're well within their rights to do that. I'm not judging that at all. That didn't even occur to me. To be to be perfectly honest, it never occurred to me that that would be something I would do. Probably maybe in hindsight, at times I thought I should have thought about that, but. But no, in all honesty, I always felt it would be a, um, a public entity. So, I mean, in the first year, it wasn't really any entity. I, I didn't, I hadn't thought beyond the first year. I, I, it sounds so strange now, but I didn't know there'd be a second festival because I didn't know if anyone would really come. I didn't know what the numbers would be. I, you have no, it's like having a first child. I mean, you can read all the books in the world and think you're prepared, but you really don't know until you're in it what's going to happen. And it was such a surreal feeling because I was volunteering at the festival at watching one of the venues and the first festival and I was standing there and there were 40 or 50 people listening to a writer. And I remember just thinking, oh, my goodness, this is really happening. This is, wow, this is like, I don't know, um, this is amazing, amazing. And the feedback was overwhelmingly positive. So then it was a matter of thinking, okay, well, what, what do I do now? Will there be a second year? And that took, I took some time out to really think about it and decide on, and so that's when I became an incorporated association, the festival did, and, and I recruited a board and we started applying for funding. And, and so that really started after the first festival. And, um, but the transition has involved, look, a fair bit of yeah, personal sacrifice, financially, definitely. I mean, I still don't earn anywhere what I used to earn as a journalist. Um, I was, you know, I, I suppose I climbed the ladder as a journalist and I was paid well for it, but it had you know, taken me a while to get there as well. So that, that causes me at times a bit of um, concern and I look at other jobs that are paid much better and in the arts and I think, should I, you know, should I leave or should I go? And but it would mean usually up, uprooting everyone and moving to Sydney or, I mean, I'm not saying it might not happen down the track. Or I have no idea, but uh, I feel very invested in the festival and I suppose it's really needed someone. I can see how people burn out and I can see how it happens. And it doesn't just happen to writers festivals. It happens to all sorts of small to medium arts organisations. And it's a real concern. And what worries me is for some reason, and I don't quite know why this is, that when you work in the arts, the expectation is, is that you will lay down yourself at all costs, no matter what it costs you, um, for the greater good, whether that's that organisation or whether it's that art form. And it's not demanded of people in the corporate setting in a way. I mean, uh, because, I, and I don't know why, I think we're, we fall victim to our own passion and our own commitment and, um, and we can be our own worst enemies. So, so I'm, I've tried, COVID was a really big full stop in a sense. And I remember thinking after cancelling last year's festival three weeks before it was to be held, uh, you know what, I'm done. I'm done. I can't cope with this. A year's worth of work gone down the drain. I don't want to do it anymore. I'll just go back. I don't know what I'll do. I'll just go get any type of job. <laughs> I'll go, maybe I'll do some casual teaching. I'll go back. I don't know. I, I really did feel disheartened. Um, but it came off the back of an incredibly stressful few months. And I think COVID gave me the chance to 
have the long service leave I'd never had because I always used it for maternity leave and I've never taken the big year off after finishing uni or school. I, you know, I had a child at a young age. It gave me the chance to take a really well-needed break. And I and I've could have probably gone either way, but I've come back reinvigorated and, and committed to um, to you know to, to leading the festival. Well, COVID is is obviously the elephant in the room when you're talking about live events of any kind. I was going to come to it later, but since you've since you've <laughs> raised it, tell us about last year. Tell us about what happened and how you dealt with it. Well, last year started strangely for me. I mean, I should give a little bit of context. Um, I've worked after I left the Newcastle Herald. I was really lucky enough to get the opportunity to train to be a broadcaster at ABC Newcastle. That's a whole other story, and. Um, gosh, you know, immensely, immensely stressful learning to do radio. I I completely um, underestimated what that was going to take. And um, it was incredibly stressful. But I loved the radio, the talking part. Anyway, I, you know, we all know that budgets have been cut. And so I was often um, used as a casual, a presenter for Drive. Um, I filled in for a well-respected, well-loved presenter who since stepped down, Paul Bevan. And I was offered the opportunity to do fill in on mornings. Um, Jill Emerson, much loved presenter, um, sadly got diagnosed with ovarian cancer. So I was sort of being trained to fill in for her. Everyone thought she'd recover and she didn't, unfortunately. Um, but I stepped away at, at the point because I couldn't do full time radio and the festival. Um, but I'd done a couple of contracts with the emergency team. So it, I, it, that was more manageable and budgets were being cut, cut elsewhere. So I wasn't getting asked to present very much and I still wanted to keep my hand in. And so um, someone I know at the ABC got me on as a, con a contractor with the emergency team. The year, before, the first year I did that, not much happened. I mean, it was the 2018 summer. You know, there were a few floods here and there. You have to jump on air broadcast to wherever you need to in Australia um, through Newcastle. So, and you're often on your own. You're working late night. You might work overnight and you might be broadcasting to WA or Tasmania. There were bushfires in Tasmania and WA that year. So I was doing some fire coverage. Jump forward to 1920 summer. I got called in for my first emergency shift, shift in September 2019 and I did not stop working for six months. So it was relentless, it was soul destroying, it was um, heartbreaking and, and I was broadcasting everywhere. So South Coast, I mean, people living all around who are even listening now may have heard my voice. I broadcast North Coast, New South Wales, South Coast, everywhere, Snowy Mountains. I was on air when the huge fire started at, uh, in the Snowy Mountains, the very first one, the Duns Fire, that started off at three hectares. And by the time I finished my shift, it, it was at, already at 100 or something. It was just ripping through. So I'd done that all summer and I had to get a festival program together. So I started last year actually quite wrecked, really deeply wrecked, thinking I don't know how I'm going to get through this year because I had a lot on last year. I was doing the leadership program with the Australia Council. I'd planned a couple of big trips. Uh, oh, look, it's a long, but I just remember starting the year with this very strong sense that I may not make it through to the festival. It was really strange. I was meant to write my opening night speech, well, three weeks out. And I thought, I'm, part of me thought, don't write it because I don't think you're going to be giving it. And I don't know why I thought that. I, I, I think I thought I was just going to fall in a heap or, or something was going to happen. And I'm prone if I'm really, really run down to getting sick. And I, I just had a really awkward feeling about it all, but I didn't think it was going to be COVID. Um, and then we launched our program in February. Christos Cholkas was in Newcastle for a special event. And I spoke that night, we had the big launch, that was late February. And then um, on the 11th of March, we issued, um, a, we're still continuing as normal and we will have more hand sanitizer. We will have regular cleaning. No, the council, Newcastle City Council runs our venues. They didn't really have a COVID strategy in place. So I had to, we, we, we invented one really. And, um, and then two days later, we canceled. So we just issued all of that social media, everything saying, you know, we're continuing as normal. We're monitoring the circumstances. This stage, we're going ahead in three weeks time. And then two days later on Friday, the 13th of March, um, we announced we were cancelling. And that was because that morning, a publisher pulled four writers from the program. Their American head office 
had said we're shutting down because America was getting really bad quite quickly, a bit sooner than us. And that's when, remember, it took us a while to shut borders to America. So when they did that, I thought, okay, if they do it and they're the first one to do it, others will follow. And this is just going to be a slow, painful winding down and, um, and I don't think I can exist like this. And, and then I think the federal government had hinted that there were going to be limits put on events, but that didn't become formalised till the week later, to the next week, and it was limited to 500. And so, yeah, we made the call. I got onto my board. I, well, as soon as I got that email from that publisher, I burst into tears. And I, well, I sobbed, actually, for about an hour. And I thought, I knew, I knew we were done. And I, I couldn't quite believe it, but I thought, this is the reality. I rang a really good friend of mine who directs the Byron Bay Writers Festival, Edwina. I was just crying. I said, Edwina, we're cancelling. I know we're going to have to cancel. And she had a lot of compassion and couldn't believe it. Um, and I spoke to Sydney because they just launched their program the night before. And Michaela said, look, we're, lo we're, we're looking like we're going to cancel. We probably won't make the announcement till the following Monday. But this was Friday afternoon. I felt like we couldn't keep taking ticket sales and the and Newcastle Herald were going to be running some stories about the festival the next day, interviews with some writers. And I thought, in all honesty, I can't let that happen. And so I made the call. I alerted the board that I think we needed to make a decision and I just sat on it and I emailed everyone and then I just thought, you know what, we need to cancel and this is what we need to say. I sent a statement to get approval from the board and we we cancelled and we stopped ticket sales and it all moved very quickly after that um but then there was the cleanup you, i mean i know you just don't know you didn't i mean there's closing a festival down and there's actually the cleaning up of that decision which is countless flights booked that had to be cancelled accommodation and me working very very hard to try to get back any money that i could because we were three weeks out we'd spent most of our money you know, we'd spent it on flights. We paid for all our accommodation. And, and I have to give credit to Ridges Newcastle. They gave us all our money back, every cent, which was a substantial amount of money. We're talking nearly $30,000. Um, I got onto the T-shirt printing people about our volunteer T-shirts. Can we see what we can do? They hadn't printed them yet, but they bought the T-shirts, but they refunded for the printing. Um, I, it, it, it was a full on week. And not only that, so we cancelled on the Friday, had an emergency board meeting on the Saturday. I was sick. I was typical. I got sinusitis, which is what happens when I get run down. I turned up to that meeting. I cried all night. I felt miserable. And, and we let our contractors go that day. So there was just me left. So I did all the cleaning up. Um, and it was a couple of people who said, why don't you go online? And I thought, are you mad? Are you serious? Like, I can't even... I can't even stop crying. Like, what are you talking about? And I thought, gosh, how could people be so, um, I don't know, like just blind to what I was going through and, you know, let me wallow a little bit longer. Uh, and then I thought I don't even know how to go online. What does it even mean? There was no model I could look at. There was nothing. I couldn't Google online writers festival. I, I, I didn't know what it could be, what it would look like. But I remember thinking to myself, so that first week after the, we cancelled was just, just getting money back, just doing the admin, just chasing, chasing. Um, and by the end of that week, I started to feel better. I got antibiotics from my doctor. I started to feel a bit better. And I thought, why are you so upset? What's the most upsetting thing about cancelling? And I thought, well, not being able to pay artists, not giving artists the opportunity to share their work. And also that program I'd invested a lot in was just going to be wasted. And I thought, well, maybe going online will help ameliorate some of that and so I got onto our amazing at that stage uni student sort of intern who was doing some social media for us and I said Zoe what are you up to Can, couldn't meet obviously in person because of the restrictions I said I'm thinking of doing this how the hell would we do it no one could tell me you know and uh, she, she looked into it and we had a YouTube channel already set up we so we all had a few things in place that worked in our favor we weren't starting from scratch and anyway, between um, Zoe and I, we came up with an online program, how to do it, which is a model that remains. It, it, I mean, we were the first ones to do it. And actually, it was someone when we tweeted about it, someone tweeted, "You, I think you're the first in the world to do this. You're not the first in Australia. I think you're the first in the world to take a literary festival online. And uh, I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'm happy to be disproved. But um, I think it was because we moved so quickly. So we cancelled a week of misery then in two weeks, we went live without 
actual festival weekend, we went live with an online program. It seemed extraordinary from the outside. No one knew how to use Zoom. Yeah. You know, Jane, I was having, you know what it was like. I mean, I was asking session hosts, could you host that session that you were going to host at the festival? But could you do it using Zoom? What the hell are you talking about? <laughs> so I wrote an idiot's guide to Zoom. Luckily, I had used Zoom. We were getting a whole lot of evaluation done of the festival last year, um, leading into a new strategic plan. So I was liaising with culture counts a bit. And they were those meetings were happening on Zoom because the main person was in Melbourne. And so we did a lot of Zoom face-to-face -face meetings. So I luckily had been using Zoom for a few months and I knew the capacity, screen sharing, all of that kind of thing. But I just, anyway, so that's what we did. We went online. It was a greatly reduced program. I mean, instead of 80 events, we had, uh, I think it was 18 or 19. But we pre-recorded everything because I was too scared about the technology. So that still remained. I mean, even up until late last year, festivals were still pre-recording a lot of the stuff, uh, their, their content pre-recorded we had it like a timetable so at 10 o'clock this will be the first session and I intentionally chose a local writer for that first session and I mean like 1500 people were watching oh, wow. David was blown away and it was also the first week really serious weekend of lockdown like the federal government only really announced maybe the week before that you can't leave your homes unless you're going to go shopping blah 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 like so people were essentially at home. That's changed now. It's evolved. We're not at home. We're out doing, we're living our life. But at that point in time, it was a particular point in time. And I look back at our videos, which are on our YouTube channel, if anyone wants to have a look at them. And I mean, yeah, look, they're kind of varied, the quality, everything. It's sort of, um, you know, but, but in a sense, it represents um, almost like an archive of a moment in time, that very early time of COVID. And so in that sense, I think it will, will exist and continue ex and exist as a, um, you know, as a, as a um, um, something symbolic for, of that, you know, for that period. And is that, is that influencing how you program? Because you're obviously planning to have a face-to-face -face festival um, later this year in September. Will that digital element remain in the festival will it will it be a different festival now because of COVID it'll be a different festival in the way we are as an audience in a, in a venue but we're going to we've always recorded sessions uh, for podcasts that will continue we always upload them after the festival we're going to have a couple of internationals so in that sense um, that's been a big change for us I mean regional festivals have, we've never had the capability to pay for an international writer to fly to Australia and I'd been in negotiations with Sydney Writers Festival around trying to utilize some of their internationals to come to Newcastle we'd been having a conversation Michaela and I for a couple of years about that and um so it's always been an us and them a bit you know when it comes to internationals and so I thought you know what why can't we have and a couple of international writers in our program this year, obviously appearing on screen, on stage via Zoom. But I've made sure that there's going to be an Australian writer on stage as well. So it's not just, you know, again, well, one person I couldn't help because there's an Australian writer and the book is so similar in themes and content. And I just knew it would be an amazing discussion with this international writer. So I, I really wanted to make that happen. Um, and it has happened, you know, um, and, but it's not going to, you know, that's just a slight change. I don't, I don't want to, it's not going to be all about internationals. And it never has been for us. So I've always been very proud. I don't have any cultural cringe around Australian writers. And, I, and it, the frustration this year is there's been an incredible year in publishing this year, incredible year. And there's so much, in, you know, to choose from. The books are, there's so much, there's so much content. I just don't have the space. The Actually, venues. One, one of the real strengths of festivals like Newcastle is the focus on local writers. I, for me, that's something that makes it a really exciting festival to be at. And I suggest that everybody should, should go in September. Yeah, well, I, I think for me, there is sometimes a sense at other, and look, I don't want, I love the international writers. I love being in the audience at the Capital City Festivals when there's internationals on stage. Don't get me wrong. But I think sometimes it can be a bit of a sense that the Australian writers are second tier. You know, there's a there's sort of hierarchy, and I don't think it's intentional. I don't think it, you know, that's what people really believe or think. But I've just had a sense of that at times. And 
that's never been the case for us. Uh, and it's interesting because someone said to me, well, won't you one run out of Australian writers? <laughs> I said, no, of course not. Because some Australian, I've got a couple of Australian writers in the program this year that I've often wanted to program in previous years. And for whatever reason, you know, themes didn't quite work, um, scheduling, they haven't been able to appear. And this is the year and I get excited. I'm like, great, finally, I've been able to include that writer. And so you can't have every great Australian writer every year. Um, you do, a, you don't have space. B, thematically, you know, there's a whole lot of other thoughts, the considerations that go into a program. And so I always think with their in sort of, I save them. It's sort of a strange sense. I always think there's always next year. There's always next year. And that's what I say to people who get disappointed because we have a public, um, a very open submission process, which again is very different to a lot of other festivals. You can apply to be part of our festival if you're a writer. You can be an emerging writer. Um, we open, you know, via our website each year uh, and they go, I, you know, they're thoroughly, those applications, I think we got fewer this year and I think it's probably because of COVID. Last, for, for 2020's festival, we got 170 submissions. This year we got about 95. So it's sort of roughly half. And so they go, we go through those thoroughly. Are they Rosemary? Oh, sorry. Are closed now for this year's Yeah, festival. yeah, yeah, well and truly. They closed a few months ago. And what um, would be the dates for next year in case people listening are interested? So, we, so if it we're in May, June, I think it'll open early in the year. So it'll probably open around sort of February and be open for a couple of months. So I'd suggest just following us on Facebook because we announce it on social media. So follow us on Facebook or whatever your chosen social media platform or check in with our website. We don't normally open in January because people are away on holidays. And it's the last thing probably people want to think about is putting in a submission. But we do look at those really thoroughly and I've got great material from, and it alerts me to writers that the, the, the mainstream publishers aren't alerting me to because they're not on their radar. They might be some self-published writers. Uh, often they're established writers who also put in a submission because maybe they don't trust their publisher to do it for them. I'm not sure. Uh, but it's I, I feel that's been a very... Um, we introduced that in the first couple of years of the festival. And, yeah, it's a lot of work. It creates more work. We can't get back to people who aren't successful in being selected. And this year is a particularly tough year. I mentioned to Jane before we started that um, I've, I've got fewer venues this year because we moved to September we're running alongside and uh, City of Newcastle started an arts festival and I figured that it might be nice to run alongside it. It's a model that happens in Perth and Adelaide. And again, COVID's given, given us great liberty to try new things in a sense. And so, um, and when we moved, a couple of venues were already booked. So then it was, oh, do we move earlier in September then? And then we'll be separate from that festival and do, oh. so it was a lot of um, juggling around with dates. And I thought at the time, that's okay, I'll cope with a few less venue, a couple of less, but it's actually 28 sessions. So we've got 28 fewer sessions this year. That's quite substantial. Mm. Um, and I'm having to be very selective because we have to make some money this year. We've got to raise revenue. I mean, it's, by the time we get to September, it will have been two and a half years since our last in-venue festival, which was 2019. Okay. And we put our online program online for free. Um, you know, we asked people to donate. We are very conscious at the time that people were anxious about jobs and we didn't know what the outcome, we didn't know if we were going to be in that lockdown for months. So uh, we didn't ticket that. And um, so, yes, we're, we're really, we, you know, we, need, we, we need to get bums on seats and, uh, and, and I'm really pleased with the program so far. We'll, we'll get to that in a moment. Um, we've put the links to the Newcastle Writers Festival YouTube channel and their website and their Facebook page in the chat box. So if you want to follow any of those things, please do that. Tell us about this year's program. What, what, what are the things you're most excited about? We're doing a couple of different things, um, possibly because we are running alongside New Annual, which is that new arts festival I mentioned. Uh, I, I kind of have looked at a bit of performance, um, just a couple of elements, and just coincidentally, a few things have fallen into place. So we're going to be working with, um, I won't give too much away, but actually um, we've got a bit of a, a production coming from Tasmania that's literary based, um, but a Tasmanian production company I'm very excited about. And so I was just on the phone to them today. We're just working out final budgets and things. 
and um, and working. And I said to them, and I'm flying you. We're flying you from Hobart to Sydney, not via Melbourne. So we'll sort out getting you to Newcastle from Sydney. But we just want to try to avoid anyone going in through Victoria, just in case, just in case something happens. Um, I'm really excited about that. That's going to be held in Christchurch Cathedral, which is an enormous historical um, venue that overlooks the city. So I love collaborating and I, I, you know, I really like working with other entities. And so, it, um, yeah, it's always fantastic when we can um, work, you get, get some new sort of fresh ideas. So that's happening on a couple of fronts, which I'm really excited about. Mm. Oh, that's great. I, um, when are you launching the program? Four, is it the 14th of February? I can, um, February, sorry, August. See, I'm still stuck in April mode. Um, it's, yeah, so it's mid-February, well, um, mid-August. We normally launch in mid-February. Um, so mid-August we'll be launching about six weeks out. Um, so, well, I guess you don't want to tell us about individual writers who'll be... Um, look, we, we'll make an early announcement about some artists in about two or three weeks. Um, so, you know, we will put that across social media and, um, and we'll be able to, you, you know, you'll be able to see if any of that, we usually announce four writers. Again, um, you know, there are some coming from Victoria. I, we're approaching it with a bit of trepidation. And um, yes, you, you know, I've been dealing with Melbourne writers on and off and they're, you know, they've been through hell, Any everyone who's lived in Melbourne. So I, was, I know at Adelaide Writers Festival, I was there earlier this year, the Melbourne contingent were well, that combination of, oh my gosh, we're out and we're with people and we can socialise and let's go crazy mixed with don't come near me, don't hug me. I'm sort of carrying some trauma from what we've been through. And so it is a very real thing. And um, we've been very lucky in Newcastle. We haven't had any community transmission. We've had no flare ups and um, we will be very safe. I mean, I think we led the way in cancelling the festival and, and that will permeate how we present this festival. So people feel safe. Uh, and, you know, things that we're putting in place to enable people to feel comfortable. I'm going to go to audience questions in a moment, but be before we do that, um, getting back to your submission process where writers can submit mm. to your festival, what, what makes for a good submission, one that you're likely to say yes to? Uh, often a writer will just have, because we ask people to give, put their bio in and, and things like that. They don't have to attach a sample of their work. But often I'll follow up with a writer and say, do you mind sending me a chapter or two? Or if you don't have a finished book, could you, or could you send me the book if you've self-published? Um, succinct and, and often an idea. So they might have a, an idea for a panel. And so sometimes I get submissions and there's a question, um, you know, something along the lines of does your proposal include other people and do you have their permission? And they'll often put a panel together around a topic. Um, and sometimes I've essentially, we've, we've included that whole pack, package, so to speak, in the festival. Or often it'll just be a writer who, so I'm thinking back to 2020, there was a person who contacted me um, who's an academic who has published a lot around climate change. And I was planning a fair bit because we were post bushfires last year. Climate change was a big kind of theme in the program. And so I was able to put that person on a panel around climate change. Now, I don't know that I would have thought of that. I, I wouldn't have, no, I do know. I would not have thought of this person. I, I, you know, I don't sit back and search every university academic or every, and so just the work they'd done and how accessible it had been and had written for the conversation and a few things like that, it, it made me think that that person's area of expertise would work very well on that panel. And so I really appreciate people making submissions and, 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 I, and we would never steal someone's idea. Like we wouldn't just go, oh, that's a great idea for a panel. Okay, I'll take that idea and put it in the program, but not use that person. Sometimes they might propose a panel and the people on the panel are all from WA and, and straight up, we just do not have the resources to pay for that. So I might say to them, look, I'm so sorry. We can, we can, we can get you here from Melbourne or Sydney, but I can't get your two suggested um, panelists, do you have other people in mind or would you like me to have a think about it? Could we collaborate on that session idea and just work it, work around it um, to be a little bit more financially viable for us? I mean, we do have a lot of free sessions in our program as well, which I think sets us apart from other writers' festivals. So we're always trying to 
it's a fine balancing act about what's paid and what isn't. And well, in a sense, all the paid sessions subsidize the free sessions. And so, um, yeah, so just to really th think about, you know, often how you work. It's, it's so, you know, I, I, you don't just choose a writer necessarily. Maybe if it's a bigger name writer, you will just choose them because they're established solid writer whose work is always good. But a lot of a, a writers festival is panels. So you're putting people together. So, you know, how, how would you fit into that context? Because it's probably very unlikely, particularly if you um, haven't been published, that you're, you know, as in have a book on the shelf somewhere that people can buy. And we still have writers in the program who, who don't have books on bookshelves that you can buy, because I think that's really important that we're a platform for emerging writers as well. So think about how what your work you'll do thematically could work. I think that's a really good key. That's, but other festival directors might work differently. But that's how I look at the program. It, it's around themes and you're grouping people together around themes that are in their books. They could be quite different books. But, so I'm putting a session together at the moment around class. So there's three very different books that have come out. One's, um, you know, a couple are memoir, one is not. And they, but they, class is a very big theme in those three books. And so I'm putting those three writers together on a panel around class. And, uh, and so, yeah, I, I think if you can think in the terms of how your book thematically, what are the strong themes? How would that fit into a festival program? Is there anything people shouldn't do in a submission? Are there, are there any things you see in submissions and think I'm not going to use that person? Um, Probably the expectation that we have endless money. So that, that's when I get, I think, well, that's just unrealistic. Like we, as I said, that panel idea, like we, we can't afford to fly four, three writers from WA. But the other thing I will often say to people, if that is the case, do you have any funding opportunities available to you? we will work with you to put in an application. So, and that's happened. That happened with New Zealand. I went to Auckland Writers Festival a couple of years ago for a, a festival directors meeting and the Australian Publishing Association met with us and they presented a whole lot of writers to festival directors in Australia and around the world. There are a few from um, Asia as well. And I thought to myself, wow, that, you know, we should have more New Zealand writers coming to Australia. Why don't we do that? And, um, and I spoke to one of the writers who I met and they, they pointed me in the direction of a grant that Creative New Zealand, or it's kind of like a similar, um, you know, to the Australia Council. And it, it supports the airfares, uh, the travel costs of writers going elsewhere um, if they've got confirmed participation in a program. So we ended up getting money to have five New Zealand writers travel to Australia last year for last year's festival that obviously didn't happen. Um, and that was a combination of working with the writers as well because they had to provide me with documentation around what this opportunity would provide for them. And um, so, you know, we're happy to work with people as well in terms of uh, applying for some financial support to come and participate in the festival. Okay. We're nearly out of time and I'm aware we haven't got to the audience question. So we might just, we could keep talking for another hour, but we're not allowed to. So I might just ask you, Rosemary, if you have any really quick answers for some of these questions. Sure. Um, one of them is, do you have any tips for people who, who would like to set up a writer's festival? Do you have any advice? Yeah, I, I've, I've helped a lot of other festivals, actually. Um, so I've been involved in helping the people who set up Blue Mountains Writers' Festival, um, the South, South Coast One Story Fest, um, Wollongong Writers' Festival started about a year after us, I think. Uh, governance. I know it's boring. All the, it's, all, it's all about the boring bits. I'm sorry to disappoint you, but get your ducks in a row with the boring bits. Have a committee, have people around you who can take on roles. You can't do it all yourself. You still will have to do a lot of it yourself. Be prepared to work long hours for no pay. Have strong connections with publishers. So I don't know if you do or you don't at this point, but, but they're your, the conduit in a way. Your, your invitation. So when I send an invitation to say Kate Grenville, Kate Grenville's invitation is going to go to her publisher. I might know Kate and I might be able to flick it to her personally, but it never, I, I will copy her in, but it always goes through the publisher if they've got, if they're with a mainstream publisher, traditional publisher. 
So you have to sort of get your foot in the door. I was, I think what was it worked in my favor was that I had a lot of solid contacts within the publishing industry who knew my work, who knew me as someone who was organized and, um, you know, and, and so it was those publishers that backed me that first year to get their writers to participate. And I called in a, quite a few favors, to be honest, people I've never, ever forgotten who came on board that first festival and helped me out. They took a huge leap of faith. And they're very special to me and they remain special to me um, because I you know, was untested. It could have been a schmozzle. The other thing is to have in mind, and this is what I did, I wanted it to be as professional as possible the first year because I figured we're setting the bar. So if, and people talk, it's a small, the literary world in Australia is very small. So if it was a schmozzle, they would have all gone to other writers and said, oh my God, Newcastle it was a joke. Everything ran late. The, you know, they'd have enough volunteers. No one was there to pick me up from the airport. Da, 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 da. All those things matter. So have a really good plan. You have to have a really good organisational brain. I hate Excel, but, you know, if that's your thing, use Excel. I create my own tables in Word. Um, so just you have to have the organisation side of it. And then you get the creative side that, that, that goes on the top. It's the icing on the cake. But you really have to have that organisational stuff um, in hand. And last, last question, um, just very quickly, on that creative side, what makes for a successful festival? Um, again, doing your reading, knowing thematically what will work, taking a few risks, if you can, um, with the program, knowing your audience. So I might have this amazing idea, but, I, but you become familiar with your audience. I think this is the journalist in me as well, you know, writing for a broad <laughs> audience. And, um, and I'm, I'm unlike probably some people who think that older audiences are a bad thing. I'm not, I love our older audience. I'm not ashamed of that. I don't think I have to go out there and work hundred miles an hour to attract 20 somethings to our festival. That might be very controversial to say that, but I think that uh, we do that. And we just had an emerging writers program for the first time uh, um, a couple of months ago, six weeks ago, but um, yeah, I mean, know your audience, know, know what you think they'll go for. You'll always be surprised, though. They'll turn up in droves to something you put in a small venue and you're turning people away. Uh, I know that happens with us with local content, local writers. I learnt that very early on. Uh, and then other things you think are going to be amazing, you put in a huge venue and you have 30 people in there. So you, every year you, you think, gosh, I wish I'd done that differently. But learn from that. Yeah, I learned from that. Okay, um, we're going to have to finish, I'm afraid, but I would encourage everybody to go to Newcastle on the 25th and the 26th of September this year to, to join in the festival. Um, we've just put the results of the poll up and I can see 25% of people have previously been to Newcastle, so that's a whole lot of you who have that wonderful experience still ahead of you. 14% um, of people have previously appeared as a speaker at a writers festival so you've got a few tips today about how you might be able to make that happen and yes we're all pretty keen on on face to face but we do like that hybrid of of digital and face to face as well um, mm. for its accessibility thank you very much rosemary for being our, our guest today um that's okay Friday, i just feel like i just rambled non-stop so i apologize oh, it's really interesting we could have <laughs> i've been in program time. mode i've been in a <laughs> You know, and I've actually been locked down in a way. That's what I, that's similar experience to being locked down. I, I've just been buried in a program. So I haven't actually talked to many people lately. Well, thank you very much for being with us. Um, our next First Friday event will be on the 3rd of July at the same time, 12.30. And we'll be talking to Benithan Oldfield, who is a literary agent and director of the Zeitgeist Agency. Uh, details of that will be in our newsletter, Newsbyte, and on our website. Thank you everybody for joining us today and we hope to see you soon at another Writing New South Wales event.